Well, I'll tell you what. I was prepared for how stupid uh, the January 6th stuff was going to be. Um, you could see everybody getting giddy before it. But there was something about this year, 2022, um, when, it come, when it came to MLK Day that sort of even took me by surprise. And Matt and I were talking about we, how we wanted to open up this show this week. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about um, when it comes to MLK. And we're going to draw some very specific uh, lessons uh, from his work and his life uh, later in this, uh, this clip and in this episode. Um, but we want to start uh, with a kind of rogues gallery of just god awful takes on somebody who spent their life fighting for justice not for him just for himself and his community uh but for the entire nation and in fact the entire globe um and we, we wanted to to push back against this kind of you know santa santa clausification of um of mlk because this was somebody who was a fighter who was a radical um, and it was not this kind of wishy-washy, Disney-fied kind of character that you see portrayed, um, you know, by big corporations whenever MLK Day rolls along. Yeah, and you know, the one interesting thing is we'll start with a Crowder clip that is sort of uh, accepting that you know reality mm -hmm. um, that he wasn't a Santa Claus, uh, but in a very interesting way. The way that is, frankly, I guess less less offensive to me than the sort of um, post-racial understanding of the I have a dream speech as if it mm -hmm. was about how the civil rights movement was too focused on race at the time uh, that we'll see with uh, Youngkin. Uh, but let's start with this Crowder clip because you see the, the actual fear uh, that, mm. um, that a, a person like Crowder is motivated by. And also like when's pacifism uh, acceptable and when is it, when is violence, you know, Crowder has a gun on his, uh, uh, desk <laughs> in his clip. Uh, and here he is, it, it, this is a, this, he's a small little boy and, uh, and he's uh, too big of a wuss for uh, MLK. And it, I, frankly, he's been more consistent than a lot of conservatives are um, that like, for instance, like think that the uh, George Floyd protests were, you know, some sort of insurrectionary communism or something. But anyway, here's uh, Crowder. Well, here's the thing. Everything we're everything. about to share with you comes directly from congressional records, archived newspapers, MLK's own speeches. And I know the FBI is not an organization that I trust. Okay, I want to be very clear. However, none of the, none of the evidence that we'll be uh, providing for you here uh, it has actually been refuted by anyone in the MLK camps. So he, 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 he slips there. He says, while I don't trust the FBI, none of the evidence has been refuted. The evidence is all just spurious FBI bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, is, this is complicated for a guy like Crowder who's trying to pose as some sort of anti-FBI civil rights libertarian uh, in the wake of the January 6th uh, protest. Uh, again, BS just to say, um, you know, BS propagated by the FBI, which... Very likely, if not, was the main actor, um, some uh, organization that was involved in the murder and assassination of MLK. Yep. Yeah, they just don't like how they obtained it. Right. It was surveillance transcripts Buggy. that were reported by a guy named yeah. David Garrow. Um, but he also, uh, uh, this is the biographer. He obtained these transcripts from the FBI. He was the official biographer on uh, MLK. He won the 97 Pulitzer Prize. So this is a man who was very pro. Mm. Did I say? You said 90, 87. 87. Yeah, you can win a Pulitzer Prize and also be a crank, uh, which this guy is. Yeah. Um, and the FBI uh, surveillance audio will be released in 2027. I don't know why they picked uh, that year. I have no idea. A specific year? Later. You know. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, crap, it's getting closer. So um, <laughs> it's funny how this parallels like the JFK assassination release thing. Like, what's the thing? We're waiting to see if the, uh, what the CIA knew about Oswald. Uh, mm. Crowder and the right, they're accepting goodies, expecting goodies that prove that MLK was a, just a monster. Here's something that you probably know that uh, MLK, for example, let's start with this, supported peaceful protest. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, that is true. Sometimes. He also had some pretty, I guess you could say, unsavory opinions uh, about riots that I do think need to be considered because a lot of people don't know this part. You continue to say to my brothers and sisters that this is not the way continue to affirm that there is another way but at the same time it is as necessary for me to be as vigorous in condemning the conditions which cause persons to 
feel that they must ga- engage in riotous activities as it is for me to condemn riots. I agree with everything thus that's, that's far. Mm-hmm. I think America <coughs> must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. Uh. What is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice his comment, just if you didn't hear that, was hate speech. Yeah, say yeah. That. Just... ...have not been met, and it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo. And as long as America postpones justice, we stand in the position of having these recurrences of violence and riots over and over again. See, and that's the problem is the open-endedness to it because, yes. well, what is justice? Well, right now people are saying, oh, injustice is there are too many Asians at uh, Stanford. Yeah. <laughs> so let's burn down a Walgreens. Yeah. Oh, exactly. more specific you that. need to be a little more specific. And let me be clear, too, at another 1967 speech, and we'll get to the crack whores, and we'll get to the origin. Yeah, so a uh, crack Yeah, I don't know how much um, I can handle. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's a... Uh, but- that's uh, the uh, the naked, uh, honest face of how I think the right feels about MLK, if they could be honest. Uh, I mean, Crowder, yeah, I think you're right in the, in the sense of like Crowder is just a nasty little slithering creature um, who's willing to c- continue to swim in those waters that everybody was swimming in in the 1960s right i mean mlk yeah. there you know the way that he's taught and we're going to go through some of these um you know modern remembrances of him by you know despicable uh, right wingers uh in, in, in just a moment um but you know they they sort of there's this version of mlk where he got everyone together um in dc and he gave a speech about how um you know we shouldn't view people by the color of their skin and therefore you know we should ban crt in schools <laughs> um and that you know racial equality has gone far enough right i mean completely ludicrous but yeah that is how he sort of portrayed today and and, and taught today even not just by the right wing but in a lot of schools too i must say um and i think this is why like you know there's a lot of holidays in the u.s are about remembrance um and, you know, it, like there are most cultures and usually you just sort of I think it's just worth it to go out and celebrate and enjoy yourself. But I do think fighting for the actual radical legacy of MLK is important. Correcting the record on these things is important um, because there is a lot of remembrance um, that needs to be done because there has been a full on campaign um, to help people forget uh, just how divided this country uh, was on the question of, you know, just basic kind of racial equality. And as difficult it is to watch somebody like Crowder there. Um, I think it is actually a good reminder because um, Crowder's not a very original thinker, right? Crowder is doing what they were doing back in the 60s. Um, yeah. And I think it's a good, little, beautiful time capsule to see uh, the kind of vile vitriol um, that sort of exists amongst, uh, you know, among the, the kind of right wing conservative reactionary brain when it comes to MLK. Yeah, really gross. Um, should we move on to some other, some more? Yeah, well, let's do, um, let's start with the contemporary. If we could get this, um, Clinton ready. Uh, yeah, here we are. Cause this is, um, this is something else. Uh, this is Hillary Clinton, somebody who <laughs> you don't have to, but I feel like you can do a better, uh, Clinton voice than me. Of course. Um, thank you. Uh, MLK said, I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exists for the purpose of establishing justice. And that when they fail in this purpose, they become dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. This is a subtweet. So, yeah, I mean, that's when you have, uh, I mean, Hillary well, Clinton. <laughs> and, and beyond so, that, just a white moderates. Well, I mean, one, she is the white moderate. And I, right. and I think it's, it's just incredible um, for somebody who, again, ran a campaign. Uh, this is somebody in super predators. We know the litany of, of charges against her and her husband and the political movement that she's been a part of her entire life. Um, but to sit here and act like, again, she is not this kind of white moderate that MLK is warning about. This person's always saying, wait a little bit. Don't be too radical. Don't be too crazy. Don't demand justice today. Demand justice sometime way off in the future, right? That is exactly the kind of white moderate that um, 
MLK is talking about. And I made the point on, on Twitter, I think it's worthwhile, that when MLK wrote this, um, letters from a Birmingham jail, right, when he was imprisoned for fighting for justice, Hillary Clinton was taking the time out of her busy schedule to knock on people's doors um, and to convince them to vote for arch conservative Barry Goldwater. Right. So sometimes it's worthwhile too to remember that the people who are around in politics today, I also think like people forget, you know, how, you know, MLK could easily be a contemporary in our political, um, you know, discourse today. Um, and the fact he was killed very, very uh, young um, by most people's standards. And you should remember that all these people talking today, a lot of these people in power today were alive during that time. And it is worthwhile, I think. Uh, to look at the actions of people, um, especially if they're going to so quickly use their words. And I'll tell you, you know, some folks got mad at me for making this comparison, saying like, well, she came from a conservative family. She was young, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the way they defended her politics when she was running for office, right? They presented it as, you know, Barry Goldwater sort of representing a maybe a positive turn um, in the conservative movement, right? And her being a kind of progressive member of the reactionary wing of American politics. I don't find that to be uh, very apologetic for, you know, your past. Right. Yeah. Your, and your actual record yeah. as being just a, like, yeah, a corporate goon. Um, well, let's get, I mean, um, oh no, we have a, we have another Dem to get to before we get to more of these conservatives. So you want to introduce us to your mayor? Yeah, so Eric Adams, you know, another, uh, he's not a white moderate, he's a moderate politician, um, you know, fresh off of uh, saying, you know, we're not like Chicago, where we, you know, uh, have to listen to a teacher's union, we can, uh, mm. you know, th this is the sort of guy we're talking about. But this is more of a funny clip that, I mean, just shows a, I mean, well, we'll play it. I, it's, I don't want to characterize it first. I mean, as if like MLK is going ISO in the civil rights movement, like clear out everybody, get out. I'm taking this fool. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, I think there's like a lot of material stuff to focus on with Adams. I mean, you know, the way he sort of sneaks in crime there um, is, is quite sinister um, as, as somebody, yes. Adams, you know, who oversaw some of the most brutal and, and racist and anti poor, um, you know, anti-working people laws, you know, these broken window laws that he sort of was um, implementing when he was in the police force, right? It is a kind of sinister uh, addition. You might not notice it on the first run. Um, the second bit, I mean, this does get to this, again, it's the Santa Claus version of, of MLK. Yes. Um, not only, look, MLK was an extraordinary human um, being and an incredible thinker and, and you know, activist and theologian. Um, yeah. But he was also the product and a member of social movements, right? And I think sometimes, too, yes. when they do the MLK thing, it's like very much like, I don't know, it's it's very individualistic instead of exactly. what MLK's entire message was, which is very collective. Right, exactly. Yeah, that that's the whole thing about like, <laughs> it's one thing if you're like, MLK's setting screens for folks. He's passing the ball, uh, the, the Outlook pass. No, it's all <laughs> like, he's, he's, yeah. he's like, I'm Kobe. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I think that's perfect. I got um, an Abbott here if we want to go to him. Well, I, I think, bef um, yeah, we could go to Abbott. I was thinking we were going to oh, go Amazon. to our corporate section. We got to do our corporate right. section yeah, first. Yeah, sorry. The corporate one, we're, we're short on time, so we're not going to be able to get to every single thing, every single bad take out there. There were so many incredible ones that people sent to us. I mean, you got private prisons saying we're going to remember MLK. You had you know Uber and Wells Fargo and all of these really nasty corporations talking about uh, Martin Luther King, right? Um, this is not something uh, that, you know, this is something that all these corporations are, are highly involved in at this point. Um, and it's extremely nasty. Um, and again, it goes into the Santa Claus stuff. But I want to highlight this one because I think this is the most dystopian thing that I saw. Um, and this is courtesy of uh, Christian Smalls, um, you know, an incredible a former Amazon employee, now somebody working on the inside to try to get people to uh, unionize those shops across the country and the globe. <laughs> So for people who didn't catch that, because the sound is the real catch of that, right? It's dystopian. You're hearing just the machines aren't even stopping. Um, but they took a moment on the shop floor uh, to remember the legacy of Martin Luther King. 
um, by playing his speech over loudspeakers while people worked in in human conditions um, for one of the wealthiest people on the planet. Right? I can't I can't provide for you a better metaphor um, for the form of capitalism uh, that we are under than than that. Right? This uh, <laughs> just dystopian roaring of machines, not a person in sight. Um, and uh, drowning out something that has a lot of content in and of itself, right? This speech that MLK gave and MLK's movement and his message, but being provided in a way to have no content, right? MLK was somebody who was fighting um, for workers, for union, for for unions, um, and to sit there and play him at the, one of the most anti-union uh, companies um, is 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 truly something something else, boy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um. Well, now we got to get to the right because um, it's only fair. Uh, we'll start. Uh, we'll, we'll get to Youngkin in a second. I just want to note, you know, every right wing, Steve Scalise, right, who is just like somebody who spent their entire life. We don't have a clip for it, but this is somebody who spent their entire life actively and not just in a symbolic way, actively fighting against MLK's vision um, and his politics, tweeting out praises of him. You have Greg Abbott, um, the governor of, of my state of Texas. Um, you know, tweeting out, you know, a kind of very vapid, you know, boilerplate MLK remembrance. All the while, Abbott is blocking MLK. Um, MLK, like he's he's signing laws that are stopping um, or, or eradicating standards that MLK be taught in high schools in the state of Texas. And just a quick note on that, um, on the CRT stuff here, what's so sinister about it is that the way that it's written is so punitive um, that educators are frightened. I mean, I have friends who teach uh, college courses at state universities here in Texas and they are, you know, you know, they're the arts, right? And I'm not saying that those aren't related to social justice, but they're not really going through history in those courses. They still are getting briefed on what you can and cannot talk about um, because you're, you know, working for a state um, educational institution and it, they, they're scared, right? They right. know that this is wrong, but they're frightened. I mean, could you imagine if you are, you know, a high school teacher with no resources, um, in a state that just sort of puts you, um, you know, at, you know, to, to ride wave after wave of, of uh, um, you know, COVID here with barely um, any support, right? Could you imagine mm -hmm. how frightening that is, right? So again, for him, Abbott to sit here and tweet, oh, we're all loving MLK today when he's actively um, trying to prevent even that history from being taught is, is something else. Yeah, like as the teachers got student loans. I mean, look at our uh, conversation with Elias Cepeda. Uh, I think he's right that, the, there's going to have to be civil disobedience style measures where teachers are going to have to test this stuff. And, mm -hmm. um, and I like, or, or like it, they're, they're going to be forced into that where they, it, whether they choose to or not to. I mean, it's a scary situation. I, I, it's really disgusting. And keep this going with Youngkin. Yeah. So here's a, a Youngkin. This is the, this is what we talked about earlier with this revision of the eye of the dream speech uh, and notice uh, uh, Youngkin says, we must, you know, v uh, judge people by the content of their character. That was mm -hmm. an aspiration in the original speech. We want to get to the point where we can do that. And I, my question for all these folks that are spreading this thing, like MLK said, you know, don't see race. What year did we, you know, meet all the conditions mm -hmm. that MLK would have said, like, OK, here we are. We it's no longer a dream. It's a reality. Right. OK. Anyway, here it is school system. Hmm. We're not going to teach our children to view everything through a lens of race. Yes, we will teach all history, the good and the bad, because we can't know where we're going unless we know where we have come from. Oh my gosh. But to actually teach our children that one group is advantaged and another is disadvantaged simply because of the color of their skin cuts across everything we know to be true. And the immortal words of Dr. Martin Luther King ring in our ears that we must judge one another by the content of our character and not the color of our skin. But this is what will be the founding principle of our executive order, what we're going to do in Virginia schools. But yeah. School says, oops. Yeah, I mean, as, as nasty as it gets, the hypocrisy is, is, is clear to anyone. Uh, but again, I mean, just to be fair and you know, respond to the challenge, as Matt was saying, about the, the aspiration of MLK to judge people by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. That was also part of a recognition that the system that we live in itself, from the legal system to the way that, you know, to, to, to voting rights, um, to, you know, the military, um, you know, to government programs, all refuse to do that. 
And yes, that is an aspiration. And it is a good aspiration, um, you know, to eradicate, um, you know, the, the kind of prejudices that have been developed, um, you know, under under capitalism and racial capitalism in, in the United States, and particularly in the, you know, the Jim Crow South. Um, but again, it was not a kind of running away from the structures that functionally um, prevent that from being the, the, the reality for us. Absolutely. Now let's get to these. Um, we got these, these ones right here and bear with me because I just think it's worthwhile to look at the historical, um, you know, the continuity here. This is Lenin writing um, in his introduction or in the, sorry, the first chapter of state and revolution on what happens to great revolutionaries after they pass away. And I think that this, you know, is, very accurate to our time. Um, what is now happening to Marxist theory has in the course of history happened repeatedly to the theories of revolutionary thinkers and leaders of oppressed classes fighting for emancipation. During the lifetime of great revolutionaries, the oppressing classes constantly hounded them, received their theories with the most savage, savage malice, the most furious hatred, and the most unscrupulous campaigns of lies and slander. After their death, attempts are made to convert them into harmless icons, to canonize them, so to say, and to hallow their names to a certain extent for a consolation of the oppressed classes and with the object, object of duping the latter, while at the same time robbing the revolutionary theory of its substance, blunt, blunting its revolutionary edge and vulgarizing it. Today, the bourgeoisie and the opportunists within the labor movement concur in, doctoring, in this doctoring of Marxism. They omit, obscure, or distort the revolutionary side of this theory as a revolutionary soul. They push to the foreground and extol what is or seems acceptable to the bourgeoisie. All the social chauvinists are now Marxists. Don't laugh. And more and more frequently German bourgeois scholars, only yesterday specialists in the annihilation of Marxism, are speaking of the national German Marx, who they claim educated the labor unions, which are so splendidly organized for the purpose of waging a predatory war. Right. And I, I think that there's a, a very close one to one here um, for what we've seen happen with Martin Luther King. It's not. Um, the march for jobs and, and you know justice, right? It is this, um, you know, it is not him calling out private ownership. It is not him calling out capitalism. We have some quotes that we'll get to, especially in this clip. We're going to play a clip of Michael um, in just one moment. Um, it's not all of this history of him. Hell, it's not even the more radical side of him criticizing the failures of Reconstruction um, and the unfair system of American Jim Crow. Um, you know, the the American Jim Crow legal system, right? It's MLK saying, one day we can all come together and we'll be happy together in this future, right? And of course, that is the most, um, <laughs> there's a reason that that's the speech that everybody knows. There's a reason that that is promoted, not because it's a bad speech by MLK, but because they wanted um, um, you know, to, to present a picture of MLK as somebody who only said the nice things about coming together and not somebody who said, no, there are systems, there are people, and there are realities that are preventing us from achieving this today. Um, and that is why it's worthwhile to push back on these things. Yeah, here's another uh, we'll get to quickly from a Dr. CBS at Black Left AF on Twitter. But uh, King on Du Bois, it is time to cease muting the fact that Du Bois was a, and this is kind of similar to like how people look at MLK now, right? Like the mm -hmm. certain, certain things get glossed over. It is time to cease muting the fact that Du Bois was a genius and chose to be a communist. Our rational, obsessive anti-communism has led us into too many quagmires to be retained as if it were a mode of scientific thinking. Uh, yeah, I, I thought that was great. No, Very I think that is wonderful. And again, you know, his his respect and, and MLK was a huge, um, you know, follower of uh, W.E.B. Uh, du Bois, um, you know, who, again, who was a communist and, you know, his work on Black Reconstruction is absolutely phenomenal. And look, I just wanted to read this quote. You could pick a million quotes from MLK to sort of show his radical side. Um, but I think this one is a very strong one. And then we're going to play uh, this Michael clip. But let me read this to y'all right quick. Um, this is MLK on, uh, on Where Do We Go From Here? A sermon from 1967. I want to say to you as I move to my conclusion, as we talk about where do we go from here, that we must honestly um, face the fact that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society. There are 40 million poor people here. And one day we must ask the question, why are there 40 million poor people in America? And when you begin to ask that question, you are raising a question about the economic system, about a broader distribution of wealth. When you ask that question, you begin to question the capitalistic economy. And I'm simply saying that, th that more and more, 
We've got to begin to ask questions about the whole society. We are called upon to help the discouraged beggars in life's marketplace. But one day we must come to see that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. It means that questions must be raised. And you see, my friends, when you deal with this, you begin to answer the question, who owns the oil? You begin to ask the question, who owns the iron ore? You begin to ask the question, why is it that people have to pay water bills in a world that's two-thirds water? These are words that must be said. Martin Luther King Jr., 1967. Hell yeah. Right? Put that on your billboard, uh, Amazon. Tweet about that, Greg Abbott. I think that's a great question for us all to be asking, especially in the state of Texas. Who owns the oil? Um, And by the way, who's responsible for plugging up those uh, devil's wells um, across the state? Right. I mean, if you want to honor this man, if you want to talk about this man, you need to look at the work um, that he put forward. Um, We'll be back in just a moment, uh, hopefully with Ben Burgess. If not, we have a a segment coming. No, Ben's here. Um, Yep. We want. I wanted to just do a quick shout. I think um, Martin Luther King's family has been very adamant and correct about the argument um, that if you want to honor his legacy, you need to be showing up for voting rights. I think that is a challenge that the Democratic Party largely has not shown up for, yeah. other than in kind of symbolic uh, ways, you know, sort of bowing their head all so Other in a kind because, of way to fundraise off of and build a yeah. you know, mailing list. And I think it's extremely nasty. We'll do more on voting rights. I'll tell you, uh, you know, it's, it's affecting many, many communities um, uh, across the country, including some uh, that I think, uh, you know, some folks might not even be expecting to. Uh, but before... Um, so we won't be able to get to a full segment on that. But I wanted to do this clip because I think it's a great clip. Um, and this is uh, Left Reckoning 50, and we owe this all to our, our comrade and friend, Michael, who taught us so much. Uh, this was a uh, this is a bit from a commentary uh, that that we all worked on together. And it's actually one of the favorite ones that I wrote together uh, with Michael um, on uh, Martin Luther King, Love and Power. Uh, this is from January 2020, uh, right after Martin Luther King Day. He was in extraordinary courageous in his obviously his physical courage in his fight against american apartheid against jim crow and for civil rights he was enormously morally courageous to earn the scorn of liberal and establishment in america by opposing the lbj genocide genocidal war on vietnam this was his true legacy and the other thing was that he actually had an incredible theological mind. And as you saw in that cold open, a really deep and profound understanding of dialectics and different dynamics, the relationship between power and love that is elemental to getting it right today, politically, economically, morally, and spiritually. He created unity within a struggle for justice, but never was apologized for or was conciliatory for injustice. Many who want to defang his legacy by excluding the truly radical nature of his politics. Let's get a little reminder of those radicalism when it comes to economic justice here. We read one day, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty and the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. He merely exists. He didn't separate these struggles. He preached a synthesis that made clear that justice doesn't just mean absence of harm, but a sharing of power, political and economic. He also understood to achieve the society, we need a radical and core shift of our values. In his beyond in his address to the Riverside Church beyond Vietnam, a time to break the silence in 1967, he wrote this. He said this, I'm convinced that to get on the right side of the world revolution, me, we as a nation must undergo a radical revolution of values. We must rapidly be begin. We must rapidly begin to shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. When machines and profits, when machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, extreme materialism, and militarism are, inescape, are incapable of being conquered. This is a 
absolutely perfect diagnosis of Trump's America in 2020. And of course, where we've been for decades after the assassination of MLK and the FBI terror campaign against him and the entire civil rights movement. But this should make us think first about his full radical legacy and how we realize and achieve it today and who's carrying it on today in modern politics globally. Secondly, we need to look at the spiritual and philosophical message, regardless of whether or not you're a Christian or an atheist or anything else. Understanding those dynamics and understanding those ideas is fundamental to that value shift so that we don't replicate all of those poisonous patterns embodied in capitalism inside our own movements and dynamics. I think that's very, very strong. And it reminds me of, uh, you know, a, a line that I've, of, that I've seen of, of MLK's recently of him talking uh, with Harry Belafonte uh, where MLK sort of regrets this, um, or has this feeling, laments this feeling that he might be fighting to integrate people into what he calls a burning house. Um, and Belafonte, you know, was wondering, well, what does he mean? What should we do? And, and MLK says, we should become the firemen. And I feel like there's a lot that we could learn from both uh, Michael's work and from MLK's work. And I'm very happy to be able to share those with you all today. Yeah, somebody in the chat put shared this quote which is just all timer love without power is sentimental and ineffective and power without love is cruel and uncaring and like mm. that really like i mean so much of this people talk about you know can we get i fucking love science and let's let's ask with the scientists so much of this stuff is really poetry and how you can need to communicate people like what the predicament is and how you emphasize things and i think like a, a statement like that just really uh, captures like a lot of like you said a lot of the problems we're actively facing now and Michael really, really loved um, that quote and that, that selection of uh, MLK's work, too, it should be noted. 